Listen in right now, Commander Sean Conley. Good morning, everyone. Since we spoke last, the president has continued to improve. As with any illness, there are frequent ups and downs over the course, particularly when a patient is being so closely watched 24 hours a day. We review and debate every finding compared to existing science and literature, weighing the risks and benefits of every intervention, its timing, as, any, as well as any potential impacts a delay may have. Over the course of his illness, the president has experienced two episodes of transient drops in his oxygen saturation. We debated the reasons for this and whether we'd even intervene. It was a determination of the team, based predominantly on the timeline from the initial diagnosis, that we initiate dexamethasone. I'd like to take this opportunity now, given some speculation over the course of the illness, uh, the last couple of days, uh, update you on the course of his, his own illness. Thursday night into Friday morning when I left the bedside, the president was doing well, with only mild symptoms, and his oxygen was in the high 90s. Late Friday morning when I returned to the bedside, the president had a high fever, and his oxy oxygen saturation was transiently dipping below 94%. Given these two developments, I was concerned for possible rapid progression of the illness. I recommended the president we try some supplemental oxygen, see how he'd respond. He was fairly adamant that he didn't need it. He was not short of breath. He was tired, had the fever, and that was about it. And after about a minute, on only two liters, his saturation levels were back over, 40, over 95%. Stayed on that for about an hour, maybe, and it was off and gone. Later that day, by the time the team here was at the bedside, the president had been up out of bed, moving about the residence with only mild symptoms. Despite this, everyone agreed the best course of action was to move to Walter Reed for a more thorough evaluation and monitoring. Now I'd like to invite up Dr. Dooley to discuss current plan. Thank you, Dr. Conley. Um, before I begin a, a brief clinical update on the president's condition, I do want to reiterate my comments from yesterday regarding the uh, how proud I am to be a part of this multidisciplinary, multi-institutional team of uh, clinical professionals behind me, and what an honor it is to care for the president uh, here at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Regarding his clinical status, the patient uh, continues to improve. Uh, he has remained without fever uh, since Friday morning. His vital signs are stable. Uh, from a pulmonary standpoint, he remains on room air this morning uh, and is not complaining of shortness of breath or other significant respiratory symptoms. He's ambulating uh, himself, walking around the White House Medical Unit without uh, limitation or disability. Our continued monitoring of his Cardiac, uh, liver, and kidney function uh, demonstrates continued normal findings or improving findings. Um, and I'll, I'll now turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Garibaldi uh, from Johns Hopkins to talk about our therapeutics and again, our plan for the day. Thank you, Dr. Dooley, and I just wanted to again reiterate what an honor and a privilege it is to take care of the president, but to be part of such a talented and multidisciplinary team here at, at Walter Reed. Uh, the president yesterday evening completed his second dose of remdesivir. Uh, he's tolerated that infusion well. We've been monitoring for any potential side effects, uh, and he has had none that we can tell. His liver and kidney function have remained normal, um, and we continue uh, to plan to use a five-day course of remdesivir. In response to transient uh, low oxygen levels, as Dr. Conley has discussed, we did initiate dexamethasone therapy, and he received his first dose of that yesterday, and our plan is to continue that for the time being. Um, today, he feels well. He's been up and around. Our plan for today is to have him to eat and drink, uh, be up out of bed as much as possible to be mobile, and if he continues to look and, and feel as well as he does today, our hope is that we can plan for a discharge as early as tomorrow to the White House where he can continue his treatment course. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Connolly for any questions. Just a moment, please. The president wanted me to share how proud he is of the group, what an honor it is for him to be receiving his care here at Walter Reed, surrounded by such incredible talent, academic leaders, department chairs, 
internationally renowned researchers and clinicians, including the support of Dr. Garibaldi from Johns Hopkins. Um, I'd like to reiterate how pleased we all are with the president's recovery. And with that, I'll take your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Conley. You said that there were two instances where he had drops in oxygen. Can you walk us through the second one? And also, I've got a question for the lung specialist afterwards. Sure. Yeah, yeah yesterday, uh, there was another episode where he dropped down about 93%. Um, he doesn't ever feel short of breath. Uh, we watched it, um, and it, it returned back up. Um, as I said, we, we evaluate all of these. And given the timeline where he is in the, the course of illness, you know, we, we are trying to maximize everything uh, that we could do for him, and we debated whether we'd even start it, uh, the dexamethasone, and we decided that uh, in this case, the potential benefits early on the course probably outweighed any risks at this time. Did you give him a second round of supplemental oxygen yesterday? Uh, I'd have to I'd have to check with the nursing staff. Uh, um, I don't think that if he did, it was very very limited. Uh, but he's not on oxygen, um, and, and the only oxygen that, that I ordered or that we provided was uh, that Friday morning initially. And about what time was that yesterday? Uh, yesterday. What was yesterday? You said the second instance. Second ins incidents. Oh, it was over the course of the day. Yeah, yesterday morning. Dr. Connolly, Dr. Connolly. what Dr. is Connolly. the president's current? Uh, blood oxygen level. That's my first question to you, Dr. Conley. 98%. And wh what do the uh, x-rays and the CT scans show? Are there signs of pneumonia? Are there signs of lung involvement uh, or any damage to the lungs? Yeah, so we're tracking all of that. Um, there's some expected findings, but nothing of uh, any major clinical concern. Dr. Connolly, I wanted to ask if his oxygen level ever dipped below 90. Uh, we don't have any recordings here of that. That's right. Dr. 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 What about at the White House? Yeah, what about here? What about at the White House or here? Anything below 90, just to follow up on her question? Uh, no, it was below 94%. It, was, it wasn't down in the low 80s or anything. No. So, okay. So on the death of the, the, the yeah. steroids, sir. Yesterday you told us that the president was in great shape, had been in good shape and fever-free for the previous 24 hours. Minutes after your press conference, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows told reporters that the president's vitals were very concerning over the past 24 hours. Simple question for the American people. Whose statements about the president's health should we believe? So uh, the chief and I work side by side, and uh, I think his statement was misconstrued. What he meant was that uh, 24 hours ago, when uh, he and I were are checking on the president that there was that momentary episode of the high fever and and that temporary drop uh, in the saturation, which prompted us to act uh, you know, expediently to move him up here. Fortunately, that was really a very transient, limited episode. Uh, a couple hours later, he was back up, uh, mild again. Um, you know, we could, I'm not going to speculate what that uh, that limited episode was about so early in the course, but. Uh, He's doing well. What are the expected findings on his lungs, and why is the president not wearing a mask in the videos and photos that have been released? Well, the, the president uh, wears a mask anytime he's he's around us, and we're all wearing our uh, N95s, uh, full PPE. Um, he's he's the patient, and when we can, uh, when he'll move out into uh, to public, we move him about out and around other people that aren't in full PPE. Uh, I assure you, he'll uh, as long as he's uh, still under my care, uh, we'll talk about him wearing a mask. In a negative pressure room. In the room is negative pressure. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of uh, his care. Okay, Dr. Conley, what's the lung function? Dr. Conley? I'm sorry? The lung function question. Can you talk about that? And what uh, you expect I would just share that, uh, like every patient, we perform lung in, uh, spirometry on him, and uh, he's maxing it out. We told him, uh, see what you can do, and it's over 2,500. Uh, milliliters each time. Um, he's he's doing great. Yeah. Are your scans Conley, showing any irregularities Conley, in his lungs? So are there any obesities? Are there anything? To disclose that the president had been administered oxygen. Uh, it's a good question. Thank so, you. I was trying to reflect the the uh, the upbeat attitude that the team, the president, that his course of illness has had. Um, 
I didn't want to give uh, any uh, any information that might uh, steer the uh, the course of illness in another direction. Um, and in doing so, uh, you know, it came off uh, that we were trying to hide something, which wasn't necessarily true. Um, and uh, so have, here I have it. He's, he is the the fact of the matter is is that he's doing really well. That he is he is uh, responding. And as the team said, uh, if everything continues to go well, we're going to start uh, discharge planning back to the White House. That's it. Thank you, folks. No, a lot of news there from the president's physician, Commander Sean Connolly. Uh, one of the things we learned, he described two episodes where the president's blood oxygen levels went down to a point where he felt they needed to be treated with a steroid. And he also uh, reminded everyone, told everyone today that the president was given oxygen on Friday, something he did not want to answer. Yesterday, upbeat at the end, saying he hopes the president might be on track to being released from the hospital tomorrow. I want to bring in uh, Dr. Jen Ashton for more on this. Uh, Jen, let's start out with these blood oxygen levels going down to a point uh, twice where the doctors wanted to administer doxamethasone, which is a steroid. Talk, tell us about that. Yeah, let's back up first, George, though, about the oxygen that the, the president was giving while still at the White House. I want to underscore two liters nasal cannula oxygen. We are taught in residency in medical school. Most of that is, in fact, going into the room. So that is a really insignificant amount of supplemental oxygen. The other interesting thing for some medical context here with COVID-19 is it has been reported from the beginning of this pandemic that patients who desaturate their blood oxygen levels with COVID-19, they tolerate it strangely very well, um, much better than patients who, in fact, are, um, are desaturating from other types of anemia. So now when you go into the treatment, George, the patients being given dexamethasone, there has been really good data out of the UK. This is the only drug that's shown a survival benefit in critically ill patients with COVID-19. Now, steroids given in that trial were given to patients who were on mechanical ventilation. So again, a demonstration, aggressive medical management by his team. Did you hear everything you needed to hear from the president's team in this press conference? Well, George, uh, there's always a lot of information. If I were in the room with his medical team, I would want to know some more specific blood tests. I would want to know something called a D-dimer, various inflammatory markers. Uh, we heard that there were some imaging tests suggestive of lung involvement. Not a surprise. Um, that's the first organ system that can be involved with COVID-19. Now they're doing ultrasounds to evaluate the lungs from pneumonia, not just chest CAT scans and chest x-rays. So we want to know a little bit more about the imaging tests and the blood tests that are being done on a regular basis. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that with you. The, the, the doctor said that the president did well in the lung spirometry. I guess that's when you blow into the tube. But when he was talking about the CAT scan of the lungs, he said the findings were expected, but didn't go into any great detail. What are, what are expected findings? Yeah, so uh, the imaging findings on CAT scan or chest x-ray or even lung ultrasound in patients with COVID-19 show peripheral involvement in the lung field. So that's the far away in the borders of the lungs. We see something called ground glass opacities. Um, you know, th these are just the things that the radiologist would be looking for, and they can be mild, they can be severe. None of this is unexpected in someone of his age uh, with this respiratory virus. And was it expected, did you expect to hear that the president could be released as soon as tomorrow? Uh, I, I'm not surprised by that, George. You know, you and I have talked about uh, the capacity inside the White House to provide pretty high-level medical care, treatment, management, uh, dexamethasone, the medications that the president is on right now can easily be given in the White House. Some of them are given for five, six, or even ten days. Blood tests can be run at the White House. Um, you know, extensive management, obviously, from a clinical standpoint, can be carried out in the White House environment. So that'll be a game time decision made by his medical team. Okay, let me bring in John Carl on the phone as well. It was pretty clear, John, that the commander wanted was at pains to try to reconcile what he was saying today with the statements yesterday and the statements he made yesterday, uh, which conflicted with the statements from the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. 
Uh, it was night and day, George. He actually came out with actual data. Uh, there was less spinning. Uh, he he wanted to, uh, you know, come out and show that, that he was, I think, very deliberately making up for what happened yesterday. And let me remind you, George, uh, Dr. Conley yesterday uh, refused several times to answer the question about whether or not the president had been on oxygen. But at one point he said, and this is a direct quote, Yesterday and today, he was not on oxygen. Right. Now we just learned, again, from Dr. Conley that, in fact, the president was on oxygen uh, on, on Friday. Um, now, that's just a basic fact. And he came out and he told us what, uh, you know, what would seem like a very serious and factual briefing. Uh, but it's such a such a problem when you have not just the, the political team at the White House, but the medical team at the White House come out and give a briefing with information that, that turns out to be flatly wrong. Hopefully this time uh, he's given us information that is correct. Yeah, he did. He was, he was definitely trying to be more specific today, tried to answer the questions, although he did still say, you know, he's trying to be as upbeat as he possibly can. On, on one level, you can understand that on the other level is that really the job of the president's position when he's presenting the information publicly yeah i mean you know at least even in doing that he 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 told us uh about the the, the two very worrying episodes the president had both on friday and yesterday uh but you know you i think that from now on throughout this process there will always be uh, you know a nagging uh question of are they trying to spin the situation to be upbeat, to give the best possible, uh, you know, description of what's happening, or are they giving us the cold hard facts? Uh, today, it seemed to be they were doing uh, a little bit of each. Right, but, and, it, but, we, and but we got the facts, and that's the important thing. He no, get the I, facts. He can say things are looking great, the president's, you know, but but we have the, you know, the, the cold hard facts of of, of what's happening. Yeah, it was definitely clear he was trying to convey that today. I want to go to Rachel Scott uh, outside Walter Reed as well. A bit of a crowd gathering there, Rachel. Yeah, that's right, George. Uh, lots of the president's supporters gathering at the gates of the Walter Reed Medical Center just right behind me. We've heard chants of USA, USA this morning. They're uh, cheering, honking horns here, uh, obviously wanting to wish the president well, want to see him back at the White House soon. And we're learning today that could be as early as tomorrow. But there is this growing list of White House officials and advisors that have now tested positive for the virus, including that cluster at the in the Rose Garden uh, for the president's ceremony of his Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett. We know the latest just Nick Luna, the president's personal assistant and body man who travels with the president, tested positive. Now eight people that attended that Rose Garden ceremony have tested positive for the virus, including uh, former Governor Chris Christie, who uh, obviously uh, works here at ABC News um, as a contributor. He tested positive, is now in the hospital. And I'm struck by something that Chris Christie uh, told you and Cecilia Vega on GMA. He was inside of the room when the president was preparing for that debate. Five of the nine people inside that room have now tested positive for the virus, George. And he told both of you that no one was wearing a mask. Right. I mean, and we had Jason Miller, the president's senior campaign advisor on the program this morning, saying that the president was encouraging people to wear masks in that phone call he had with Jason and that Jason reported on earlier today on this week. What other activity are we expecting from the president today? It seemed like he had a pretty steady stream of phone calls yesterday and we saw that video that he released last night. He did, George, and he also spoke with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell yesterday, who again reiterated that the president was in good spirits. Look, the White House has made clear that the president is still working, that the president is still in charge. Yesterday, they released photos of the president uh, behind the desk. Obviously, the president wanting to address the American people himself after that press conference with his uh, medical team, telling the American people that he is on the road to recovery, though he did say that he's not out of the woods uh, just yet. Uh, the president said the real test will be over the next few days, uh, but obviously he could be back at the White House as early as tomorrow, George. The headline, thank you, Rachel. The headline from the president's doctors that it, they say he continues to improve, is being treated now with steroids and remdesivir, and they're hoping, they say, that he can be released from the hospital as early as tomorrow. We're going to return to our regular programming. Have a good afternoon. This has been a special report from ABC News.
I'm Wade Johnson in New York, and we're continuing our streaming coverage, continuing coverage on ABC News Live of President Donald Trump, who is now being treated at Walter Reed Medical Center just outside of Washington, D.C. You saw there in our previous special report the doctor who is treating him, the team of doctors there at Walter Reed coming out, giving a briefing. And there were a couple of uh, big headlines that jumped out to us. First, Dr. Sean Conley talking about two separate episodes that President Trump experienced where his blood oxygen levels dropped into the lower 90s. There was one yesterday and then one on Friday. Yesterday at the briefing, there were contradicting statements coming from the doctors in the White House, so it took a while to get some clarity. They provided a little bit more today. But again, that headline, he had another episode, President Trump, yesterday of his blood oxygen levels dropping down to 93%. The day before, it was 94 Now, the doctors didn't appear to be too alarmed by that, but as a result, they started giving him this steroid that has been used really around the world and has been showing some promise, uh, dextromethasone, and that is one of the big headlines coming out of this uh, press conference so far this morning. But the doctor reiterated that he believes that the president is doing well and is on the road to recovery. For more on this, let's get back to our chief medical correspondent, Dr. Jen Ashton, who's been following all of this. And, and Dr. Jen, just walk us through um, this steroid and the significance, because I know you've been reporting on this over the course of many months, the significance of the president being treated with this at this stage in his illness. That's a really important question. Let's back up, though, to cover this whole issue of his oxygen saturation. First of all, with COVID-19, we are not surprised in the slightest to see some transient, intermittent, even recurrent episodes of what we call desaturation, of a drop in the blood oxygen level. Um, how far that, go that number goes down and how long that lasts, obviously, those are two really important variables. What's been interesting about this disease from the beginning, doctors noticing that patients are dropping their SATs, desaturating their oxygen levels to low levels, much lower than we would expect people to be asymptomatic, talking to us, feeling fine. We heard that the president felt fine even at 93, 94%, and in fact, really didn't want supplemental oxygen. That is a classic and mysterious hallmark feature of this virus. We still don't understand why it behaved that way. Now, when you talk about the oxygen that Dr. Conley said the president was given while still at the White House, I want to emphasize to people two liters nasal cannula, those are the prongs that go uh, into the nostrils. That is an insignificant amount of supplemental oxygen. We are taught in, in residency that that's pretty much going into the room. So uh, that is not a, an alarming fact or revelation here. When you get to the, the issue of the steroids, Wit, this is significant. There's been a really important data released from the UK. We reported on it across all ABC platforms. This is the only drug, dexamethasone, that has shown a survival benefit in critically ill patients with COVID-19. So these are patients who are intubated on mechanical ventilation, obviously requiring a lot of supplemental oxygen. If given too early in the course of COVID-19, there are suggestions in clinical data um, and literature that it can actually worsen outcomes. So in the case of the president, it's really an issue about deciding when or if to pull the trigger on this latest tool in your toolbox. Um, the decision to give steroids for two brief episodes of desaturation uh, was clearly not one made lightly on the part of his team, which included critical care, pulmonary specialists, infectious disease and, experts, and, and, um, Dr. and again, Dr. Ashton, for versus benefit. Uh, forgive me, I just want to pick up on that exact point that you're making because you were talking about how the fact that this is this is really an aggressive approach as we're hearing with not just this steroid but also this antibody cocktail and also the remdesivir. Uh, many of these treatments, as we've been reading about them over previous months, were given later on in the illness, but with the president, they seem to be going for it right away. 
Yeah, Whit, this is really the interesting thing here. Um, I'm going to give you a big picture view on this. First of all, um, we you've heard me say it. You heard the president's medical team say it yesterday. This is not just any average patient. This is the president of the United States, so they are acting aggressively. However, that falls under something in medicine called the VIP syndrome. Do you mm. treat certain patients differently than others? There are real risks to that, um, as there are with anything in medicine. So you have to balance those risks versus benefits. Your question, really important with, because they acted early in the antibody cocktail, early deciding to give remdesivir, and fairly early in deciding to give dexamethasone. Uh, and again, there's risk versus benefit to those decisions. And beyond the risks, there's also the optics of it, because you have thousands of people across the country who are sick, some of them dying from this disease. Many of them have family members who may be suffering from this disease, and they're desperate for anything, and likely they're going to be asking their doctors for these exact medications. Well, and this is why the practice of clinical medicine is not robotic. It is not one size fits all. It is not cookie cutter. Um, and you know what I have a saying, in a hospital gown, everyone looks the same uh, from the billionaire to the homeless person. And, and for the most part, that's how patients are treated as individuals. Um, but, but clearly some aggressive measures being taken because of who this particular COVID patient happens to be. Uh, no question about it. Dr. Jan Ashton, stand by just for a moment. I want to get to our uh, chief White House correspondent, John Carl, who's been uh, joining us over the phone. John, I know that you heard the press conference that we had from the doctor, Sean Connolly, uh, yesterday. Uh, today, a little bit different. It seemed like he went from a, a piece of paper, some key bullet points and facts that he wanted to get out so they didn't have that same confusion that we had. Do you think that he cleared up uh, some of that mess that came yesterday? Well, it, it was night and day. Uh, it was a very different briefing. It was still brief. Uh, they still left a lot of questions unanswered. But Dr. Conley, in stark contrast to yesterday, uh, came out and presented some actual facts. We learned uh, the, the oxygen saturation level. He told us something he absolutely refused to tell us uh, yesterday, which is the president had been on supplemental oxygen. Um, in fact, during the back and forth yesterday, he at one point said the president had not been on oxygen uh, either uh, yesterday or today. In other words, either Friday or Saturday uh, is what he said yesterday. Now uh, we learned that that is, that is not true. We, we learned that the president was on oxygen on Friday. And, it's, and I was left still a little unclear whether or not he had been on oxygen, in fact, again yesterday uh, when his uh, oxygen level in his blood dropped once again. Uh, but, you know, but I, th I think Dr. Conley went a long way uh, towards, uh, towards reestablishing some credibility by, by giving, giving the data, uh, telling us, uh, uh, you know, specifically about the treatment. It was a, it was a much more substantive briefing and, and, and less of the span. I mean, he did say the president is doing, doing better. He did say that he hopes the president is able to go back and continue his treatment from the White House uh, as early as tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, I mean, frankly, Wade, I, I know you watched the four-minute video the president posted on Twitter uh, yesterday. Uh, for somebody who is going through all that he's going through, he looked good. I mean, so mm -hmm. that's what I thought. He, he he looked good. He spoke, you know, for four minutes. Uh, he sounded pretty good, uh, uh, looked good. Uh, that does not, you know, diminish the seriousness of his condition and the importance of getting, you know, actual facts out of his medical team, not just spin. And, and John, as you mentioned that, we've actually been playing that video of the president uh, sending out that message. We've also seen photographs of him signing papers, not exactly sure what those papers are. We're trying to get more information on that. Uh, but just the, the timeline here um, from yesterday, there was also confusion about uh, Dr. Conley said, you know, 72 hours in his treatment. And then later he and the White House had to clarify that it was day three. And so everybody was trying to figure out when did they know, um, because the president had these campaign events last week. Um, how much, I mean, bottom line from what Dr. Ashton was saying, the oxygen information may not be that significant, but when the information and the facts of the public get muddy, then there becomes a credibility issue. Um, what is the White House doing right now to try to correct that? 
Well, well, there's a real there's a real credibility issue. Uh, the, the, the timeline was was particularly odd, and, and and you need to be precise. Especially, this is the medical team. This isn't, you know, this isn't Kaylee McEnany getting up and 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 doing a political briefing as as has become the norm in, in the White House. This is the medical team, and uh, you know, the, if, if you if you took the seventy two hour thing. Uh, at face value, which, well, I mean, why wouldn't you? It's the medical team. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- that would have him beginning his treatment Wednesday. And, of course, he went, you know, he had a, he had a, he had a full day Thursday, and he went to New Jersey and uh, had, had a you know fundraiser, including an event that was indoors, actually included a buffet meal. Uh, you know, highly uh, irresponsible if that was the case. Uh, it's still not clear. Now, they, 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 they went and said that the timeline, you know, they made a mistake in saying that, and, that, and they meant, you know, third day, not 72 hours. Etc. But uh, we, we still don't have an answer to the question of when was the president's last negative test, and when precisely did they first have a positive test uh, for 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 COVID nineteen? These are these are significant questions. I, I'd also point out, with this may sound um, trivial, but it's really not. When when the White House Physicians Office put out its written statement on on this uh, yesterday, written statement. This is, you know, before the briefing and all of that. Uh, they actually misspelled the name Regeneron, the, the name of the, of the pharmaceutical company that, that made the treatment uh, that they uh, that they provided him. Now, that, that's not a huge deal, but they also m- misdescribed the treatment. They said it was uh, a polyclonal and it was monoclonal. Now, to, to me, and maybe to you, those differences don't mean much. But to anybody who is an expert in this area, that's all the difference in the world. So when you exactly. have it, it, in a written statement coming out of the physician's office with two pretty glaring errors, one maybe just a typo, okay, uh, but but the other a, a fundamental mistake about the kind of treatment he's receiving. Uh, it, it does raise question about about the reliability of the information. Now, like I said, I, I think that they uh, went a long way towards reestablishing some credibility by coming out today with some with some actual facts and and less in the way of spin. Yeah, and the bottom line, as the doctors were saying, it does seem that President Trump is improving on the road to recovery, although still within that window of concern. Uh, John Carl for us. Thank you so much. Uh, we do appreciate it. I want to check in with our Rachel Scott, who's actually right outside Walter Reed Medical Center. Rachel, there's been a, a crowd gathering there of Trump supporters who've been wishing him well. Uh, talk to us, though, about what this has done not only for the White House, because there are, there is now a ripple effect of positive cases now there, an outbreak they're trying to contain, but the campaign moving forward less than one month until Election Day. We are just one month until Election Day, Wit, and this is really something that we have never seen before. Right now, you have the two heads charged with leading the president's re-election efforts. The chairwoman of the RNC and the president's campaign manager both have tested positive for COVID-19. That is a staggering development uh, with just uh, less than 30 days to go. We are uh, we have no idea whether or not there will be any more presidential debates. Uh, Joe Biden said that he hopes there are for two reasons. One, that would mean the president is obviously well enough to be back on stage, but secondly, so that he can make his case to the American people as to why he deserves uh, the Oval Office. Uh, But we do know that the Trump campaign is going to be pushing forward. They'll be doing a little bit more virtual events. Vice President Mike Pence will be back out on the campaign trail. He's expected to be in Arizona just one day after the vice presidential debate, and that is still scheduled to take place. That's happening just on Wednesday, Wit. All right, Rachel Scott Forrest, right outside Walter Reed. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to try to go back to our Dr. Jen Ashton, uh, if she's still with us, just to kind of sum things up, Dr. Jen, because we know that uh, he's in this still this initial window of concern. What are some of the things that that we need to be watching uh, in the coming days? Well, Whit, first, in terms of the timeline, uh, there's no magic line in terms of days or hours whereby someone is in the clear, so to speak. This is uh, a very new virus. It's been shown it has a wide range of severity. And we're talking about someone who has multiple risk factors, his age, his weight, um, and being a man. So uh, to be sure, 
you know, it's day to day, certainly first two weeks, if not longer, um, and that that will be a close follow up period. The other things I want to put um, on your radar, um, I would like to hear something from the medical team about whether or not they're considering changing the president's position. Pruning, we've heard a lot about mm -hmm. that. It can increase oxygen uh, delivery to the lungs just based on positioning. Um, I would like to hear some lab results um, and some more specifics about the imaging testing that the president is going through in terms of looking at his pulmonary function, chest x-rays, CAT scans of the chest, and ultrasounds of his lungs. Um, and then I want to echo something that Jonathan Carl said of, about communication of medical information. Uh, this is really medicine 101. First of all, it is the job of the physician taking care of a, any patient to know every single thing that has gone on in that patient's course of illness by the hour. Um, you know, and this is something that we have all gone through in our training. Um, accuracy matters. Typos matter. Terminology and using accurate um, words in describing experimental treatments absolutely matters. But to me, Whit, the most important thing, and we heard it here today in the presser, is it is not the job of the medical team or the physician to try to guess or interpret what the reaction to information will be. Um, you know, my job as a doctor is to give you the information and to help you interpret it. It's not to try to guess how you're going to respond to that information. So I think we're seeing multiple aspects here in the practice of medicine that will continue to unfold as we follow this story. But um, you know, there are certain things here that are applicable to absolutely any patient. And then there are certain aspects of this story that are specific because this patient happens to be the president of the United States. Exactly. And as you pointed out there, I mean, look, the average person listening doesn't understand the difference between a 93%, 94% oxygen saturation, but when suddenly they're not giving us the information despite uh, reporters asking questions, then it feels like they're holding something back. But today it looks as least, at least as though they attempted to put some more factual information on the record. Just a follow up to that though, Dr. Jen, as we hear about the president's oxygen saturation levels, at what point does that number become a real concern? Every patient's different with, you know, um, you know, my brother who's a physician also had COVID. Uh, he was getting up, walking around, his numbers were dropping. I've heard from colleagues who have been caring for the most critically ill COVID patients that they see patients speaking without difficulty, without symptoms, where their O2 sats are in the 80s, mid to high 80s. We do not see that in other types of pneumonia. Um, so there are some mysterious features here. I've spoken to Dr. Anthony Fauci about this as well. This virus behaves differently, and every patient has to be managed and treated individually. It's not just that we get to a certain number of oxygen saturation and everyone gets the same treatment. So uh, that's where there's the art of the practice of medicine, not just the science. And we are learning by the day. Dr. Jen Ashton, thank you so much. We do appreciate it. Just a quick recap. We got the update from the president's team of doctors there at Walter Reed Medical Center saying that the president is doing well, that he's on a road to recovery, but he did have a couple of episodes with his blood oxygen level dropping. He is now taking the uh, dexamethasone, that's the uh, steroid, in addition to the antibody cocktail and remdesivir. These are, these are three uh, treatments that have been used. The president now receiving all three of them very aggressively but again, the doctor is giving that encouraging headline that President Trump is on the road to recovery. We'll have much more information throughout the day on abcnews.com and on the ABC News app. And of course, a full wrap up tonight on ABC World News tonight with Tom Yamas. For now, I'm Whit Johnson in New York. You're watching ABC News Live.